so this is a quick oh we should do introductions first i'm anish i'm going to present uh, a proposal for multi kvm i'm going to walk everyone through the what the why the how uh, should probably just take around 4 minutes i just have four slides and then i'll open it up to questions which is really the whole point uh, so yeah if you do have questions in the middle of the presentation just hold off it's not going to take very long to get to the last slide uh, okay so the what uh, so the proposal is to allow uh, multi kvm which would be running multiple independent kvm modules on a single uh, linux host uh, why would we want to do that so we can upgrade and roll back uh, kvm with minimal disruption to running guests uh, they would also allow running kvm modules with the same version but different uh, command line args on the same host uh, and that also allows easier testing uh, ab testing on the same host for kvm uh, sorry the slide doesn't move okay uh, so how we propose to do, do this is uh, there's a bunch of steps uh, some of them have already been started so the first is isolating kvm internals from the rest of the kernel uh, sean already has a patch series out this is something we would like to do even if it doesn't lead to multi kvm because it's just good design uh, principles that go behind the the patch series itself uh, and then to move on to running multiple kvms on the same host the first thing would be to collapse vendor modules into kvm.ko uh, this allows us to expose multiple kvm n modules and multiple dev kvm n devices uh, without having to worry about the exports that the vendor modules require from kvm and they won't have to be versioned uh, in this case the kvm n and dev kvm n post fix is defined via a config string uh, by default we want that to be null or off so it shouldn't change the status quo if you opt out of the feature you would still get uh, one kvm except this time it wouldn't have vendor modules running on top of it uh, we would introduce therefore a new base module uh, which kvm the new kvm would run on top of uh, the name for this is uh, virtualization acceleration code unupgradable units with a bit of a mouthful uh, mostly a backronym from vacuum uh, <laughs> it does suck so yeah, um, yeah. so <laughs> that would be the new base module the, the point of this base module is to have shared system resources that cannot be in multiple kvms running on the host because they would just clobber over one another and they need to really be shared between uh, multiple modules uh, and then the goal here is that user space should mostly be unaware of these changes uh, so making sim links between dev kvm to dev kvm n or using bind mounts should mean that user space uh, vmm changes should not be required it should essentially just function the way it does today uh, and all deployments and which kvm would work on what kernel is not really the responsibility of this project that's something that deployment whoever controls your deployment would handle uh, on their end okay so that is my presentation i just was going to bring up a few things that i think might be good to get feedback on but it's not limited to this list so uh, hiding those kvm internals from the rest of the kernel that's something we would like some feedback on uh, module name it's always a sticky subject nobody likes naming i'm bad at naming uh, it's not even my name to be honest but uh, and then collapsing those vendor modules for x86 into kvm uh, i would like some feedback on that if people have thoughts and then anything else people want to talk about so can you go into a bit into more detail of what would be in the maze module i mean i, I assume it's the one that actually calls vmx on but i, I guess yes that is one of the things it has so hardware enable disable logic would go in there the, the goal in principle is to minimize what goes into the vac uh, because uh, that's the part that you cannot upgrade. So the, the principle would really be to minimize that. Uh, and it also has a list of uh, VMCSs, uh, VPIDs on Intel. Yeah, uh, Sean, you might have more. Yeah, um, so hardware-wise, ACIDs on AMD, VPIDs on Intel. Uh, so anything that you have to have a singleton throughout the entire system, uh, that base allocation management would go in back. Um, it would also serve as kind of a mediator slash trampoline so that the 
core kernel doesn't have to be so aware that there may be multiple things sitting on top of that back module. So like perf callbacks um, would be one where you have the back register of perf callbacks. So perf doesn't have to walk through a bunch of different things saying, hey, are you the right KVM? Hey, are you the right KVM? We just have one call. So we mediate some of that stuff. Um, user return MSRs on x86 is another one that ideally would go in back because then there's some nastiness there with capturing state in IPI handlers, which uh, you can accidentally snapshot a guest MSR instead of a host MSR if you take the IPI at the wrong time. Um, other things. But yeah, the, the base principle is if it can stay in KVM, we want it to stay in KVM so you can upgrade it and you can change the. <coughs> So the kind of the elephant in the room is like all of these multi KVMs would be out of three modules. Like they would be out of three in the sense that they are uh, compiled for multiple versions uh, of uh, like KVM itself, like Linux.git itself would contain only one KVM module uh, because, uh, yeah. So the question is, uh, do you see a use for the VEC uh, outside KVM, like other uses of virtualization uh, of virtualization facilities in Linux that would kind of justify the existence of the VEC? We do not have any planned. Um, and I, I can make up use cases, but I don't know <laughs> of any that are actually uh, that anyone actually wants to push forward. I just want to talk about the motivation of this. If I understand correctly, it's basically about live update, right? You want to be able to, you've got your old KVM, you now want to switch, you want to run your new KVM, right? That is it's one of one of the, what, yeah. <laughs> this one, yeah, it's all just made up. Um, so live update is actually something we are not sure we want to pursue with this um, because you get into a matrix of kernel versus KVM modules that you have to validate and that just makes everyone cringe. <laughs> um, and so the other way that we're looking at this is for deploying new features because then you can say if you've got base kernel X that's your minimum for supporting this new feature. And if you're before that, you can't get this new feature. And then you limit your, um, your test matrix because you're not, trying to, you're not trying to upgrade every kernel in your fleet with this mechanism. Um, you're just trying to roll out new features to specific um, base kernels or even specific platforms. And then use things like um, live patching or, I mean, that's the big one is if you have security feature, security fixes that you need to roll out somewhat quickly use other mechanisms for that we're not completely ruling out live updates in terms of using multi kvm but we're also not gung-ho on it because yeah i mean you could still ways. use it if you have a better validation strategy but it's not something we are particularly <laughs> yeah. interested in i guess what i was what i was trying to figure out is if we had a good solution to live update would we still need this or would we actually then use for feature rollout right but yeah. you could do feature rollout with live updates right and then you end up in a state where you don't have you're not you don't have to run all the kvms at the same time because you, your old vms are still running on the old version of kvm right what do you mean by live updates i think that's what we have to yeah. right. clarify <laughs> we need another one of these um but basically the ability to update your entire hypervisor right and that that's another thing where i think you're going to hit limitations of this pretty soon we're like okay i can update my kvm module but the rest of my kernel i still need to do live patching or something right and if we had a good solution sean, sean why don't you just come up here you can use this mic yeah. and that way yeah. <laughs> if we could yeah. just update everything i mean isn't that a preferable mechanism it gives you the ability to update your whole kernel not just KVM. oh i mean in a perfect world, absolutely. I'm not convinced that we're going to get there in the next four years, though. To get to a point where we have where we can we can achieve the same level of downtime mm. with if you already have your other KVM instance there, and you're not going through KExec, you're not spinning up user space again. I mean, even if you get the full kernel upgrade to a point where it's acceptable. I would assert that you're still going to have 
a longer downtime than what you can achieve with this. Well, this has no downtime because you're not actually upgrading, right? Your old VMs are still running on if old you KVM. Go with, you live migrate to the other KVM, right? If you, yeah. if you use this mechanism to do a lot, uh, if you use this mechanism to upgrade a running KVM, which that's the part that we're like, yeah, we're not sure we mm. want to do. Um, my point though is I, they are overlapping, overlapping, but I don't see a full kernel upgrade supplanting this entirely because it can't, I mean, you're never going to be able to get to a point where you have zero, like literally zero downtime. Uh, it's just not gonna happen. Um, like you, yeah. you have to run some code. Like you can hide, yeah. you can play a lot of games to yeah, hide it. But... CPUs do you need for that? What's that? Yeah, but how many CPUs do you need for that? Need for what? To run that some code. Oh no! I, like, I, stuff, yes, right? and you can keep hey, it let's, running let's in the guest. Set up all those secondary CPUs and have them do yeah, nothing, yeah. and then bring them. Oh yes, no, I'm I'm in total agreement that <laughs> it, the ideal goal is you keep the vCPUs running in the guest while you're swizzling bits on the host. But again, I don't think that that is something that we can, especially internally, I don't think we can achieve that in the next four years, realistically. Um, whereas this is, for us, at least a stepping stone. The other thing that, um, from like an upstream hat on that I like about this is being able to test different module parameters. And then that pushes back on things like, um, we want to run one VM with mitigations disabled and other VMs that we don't trust with full mitigations enabled, um, like the NX huge page disaster that I despise. We have a capability so we can turn it off per VM. I was like, that shouldn't exist. Like, But that doesn't have to be module parameters, right? That can be VM it, parameters. It they, doesn't have to be, yeah. but it simplifies KVM. Uh, like the reason we don't support, we could theoretically support shadow paging alongside EPT I don't want to support that from an upstream perspective of, oh, we have, like, it's nice when you can just look at the module, you have TDP enabled or you don't have TDP enabled and you can have a whole bunch of decisions on that. You don't have a per VM pointer that you're dealing with to decide what set of yeah. all that things I'm using. So it's yeah. chewing on different complexity to achieve multiple things is the idea. Yeah, so in that case, it's not actually about live. It's not actually about updating. It's actually you want different flavors of KVM running next to each other on the same host, and you want to be that yeah at the KVM module level. Yeah. There's a question. I think Oliver had his hand up. No. Okay. And then something on that side. Hi. Um, this is regarding the isolation that you have over there. Um, so later we have a talk about sharing more details between the guest and the host, especially on the scheduler uh, front. For example, VCP is preempted. So those kind of, um, there are some uh, scenarios where we would like the host to have a better understanding of what happens inside the KVM to make better scheduling decisions, memory management decisions, etc. So by this, uh, we might be compromising on that or yeah, so the idea here isn't to say the host can't ever talk to KVM and vice versa, but that uh, when we say isolation, it's isolating the gory details of KVM. So right now, struct KVM, struct KVM vCPU, a whole pile of stuff that should not be exposed to the kernel at large is all visible in KVM host.h. And so there are details bled everywhere. and. That means if you wanted to change the layout of struct KVM vCPU in any way, mm -hmm. you're risking something in the kernel having the offset as X, and then you change to X plus two, and things blow up because you're clobbering KVM. So that's what we mean by isolation. We're not saying that thou shalt not talk. Uh, it's just really the, the details of things that shouldn't be exposed, and then have proper APIs when you do need to talk uh, between the core kernel or um, like KVM GT needs some hooks into KVM, just have very well-defined APIs for when you're moving stuff in and out of KVM to the rest of the kernel. Okay. Although with KVM GT, that makes it mutually exclusive. For this multi-KVM. Because no yeah, one wants so. to use that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if I understand correctly, we'll have some opaque handles that the other parts of the kernel can use with an API or something to get details. I'm, 
Uh, yeah, I, I would have to, I don't know exactly what you have in mind, <laughs> so I'm not going to commit either way. The question was, do you want to get guest information or KVM information? Um, the guest information through the KVM module to the scheduler. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's basically some information from the guest, but that KVM is providing that through shared memory. So. That's it. Thanks. I think we have. We might also be out of time. I don't know how long this uh, talk is. Paul, the artist, he's banned yeah. up today. <laughs> Hi. So uh, I have another kind of high level question about this. Uh, is there any prior art? Are there any other kernel modules that do support some kind of, you know, multiple versions at the same time? Uh, this doesn't seem specific to KVM, so I'm curious if you have investigated it or if anyone else in the room knows about any of these kinds of solutions. To my knowledge, there's nothing in tree. Um, out of tree, people have done this exact thing to the varying degrees. Um, and I'm guessing out of, well, I mean, out of tree, people have done all kinds of crazy things, I can guarantee. Um, but as far as what's been upstreamed, I don't know of another uh, use case like this. Thank you. You talked about combining KVM Intel and KVM AMD and KVM.ko. Is what is does that extend to other architectures as well besides x86? Ah, no. So this is purely an x86 wart. Um, the the downside to um, dropping them into the uh, single KVM module is just your text increases. Um, you get a small benefit today if you're running on Intel. You don't have to load KVM AMD, so you save that text. That's really about it in terms of what you benefit from it. Um, as far as other architectures, this is almost purely x86. The only thing that affects other architecture is, is hiding the internals. Um, and that one gets a little bit ugly because like ARM and S390 need to get at some offsets in KVM vCPU so that they can feed those into KVM ASM. Um, and that was how we ended up. If you look at the RFC, it was just uh, if def um, shenanigans instead of any invasive changes. And it's going to be kind of a strong, like a heavy lift to be able to load text into EL2, like for the NVHU use cases for uh, the ARM, it's not like running in a kernel context anymore. So you need to build your own way to load text into there as well, which would be kind of a pain. But... Wow. <laughs> Is it left? So or? actually mentally I had read that as collapse KVM.ko into KVM Intel and KVM AMD. While so why would you have one module from, for both Intel and AMD instead of linking uh, the, the common code twice into the two vendor models? And actually, maybe there is a, not exactly the same thing, but there is a precedent for KVM on power where you can, uh, like, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can have both the um, uh, hardware accelerated uh, virtualization and uh, the trap and emulate virtualization. And they are two separate modules, I think, uh, and uh, you can only load one of them at a time. But in principle, you could have both of them active at a time. Like so some VMs running uh, under top on emulate and some VMs are running under. Yeah, yeah. Under I mean, we're going to end up with that on x86 for Intel with TDX versus VMX to some extent. They're not going to be separate modules, but you're well, going to be running two flavors of virtual. I mean, that's what you have on PowerPC, though. You have two different versions flavors of virtualization running side by side. Yeah, but on PowerPC, there are different uh, modules. So you have to choose the one that you load. Yes. So as you cannot as... have uh, at the same time on, on a PowerPC host, both uh, the um, hardware accelerated and the tap and emulate uh, virtualization. Yeah. So I guess yeah, so like, it essentially boils 10 down years to... ago, there was uh, actually a good use case for this thing. Uh, but so uh, going back to the other question, why would you uh, fuse the two modules and not link the same code to, into two of them? We just didn't do it. I think from a code perspective, <laughs> it'd probably be quite, if we want to go in that direction, I think it'd be very easy to, I mean, it might even just literally be the make file changes. Yeah. <laughs> Would simplify the whole tremendous thing between the game and the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I don't know that it would actually simplify code. You would still need vendor hooks. They're just going to be resolved at link time instead of. Yeah, but we have everything static patched. Oh, like I agree from like it, but I think the the amount we would move the needle is actually quite small. Like I, I'm fully on board. I'm just playing devil's advocate. <laughs> I want to ask because you mentioned one use case for security. So, what you will be running with multiple modules, and one, let's say, would be more have some security update on or some kind of security feature. So, it would be kind of more privileged or I don't know, more trusted than another one. And now the question is if you wanted to have that, do you have mechanisms in place to actually start isolating this? Because now you will have this core which is like, you know, unmovable, and when one module, which is less trusted, another, which is more trusted, oh, and they're yeah. going to all talk together, and if you don't have isolation, you don't have boundary. so, you know, this fact that you're doing it is... It's not that... Uh, the use case isn't that one KVM module is more trusted than another, it's that the workload that is running inside the guest, specifically the kernel, and it's not even... I wouldn't even say it's more trusted, it's that the performance versus risk trade-off is different. So large VM, big customer, that is paying a lot of money. If they start uh, attacking with multi, uh, was it ITLB multi-hit and start crashing hosts, and we see it's coming from their VM, we can be like, hey, large customer, you're really screwing up. We're going to start charging a lot of money. So we can turn off that mitigation for those VMs versus a VM that's being spun up for someone that is like just running one-off VMs and we don't have as good a paper trail. It's not that we trust them any less okay, or so anymore. So it's not, it, 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 it's not. But we like, but the risk versus reward of letting them potentially crash the host isn't there because they're not paying as much to get better performance. Okay, so it's not for fixing security issues potentially in KVM oh, no, itself. No. <laughs> <laughs> This may be totally not at all where you want to go, but just out of curiosity, is there any chance that you could use this to implement address-based isolation where every single VM has its own KVM? I don't think that... I think they're orthogonal. Okay. Um, because the address space isolation isn't so much about the KVM instance, it's about the, I mean, literally the address space. And so the KVM, I mean, today requires that you have, uh, that you can only do the interesting ioctals from the process that owns KVM, that originally created KVM. There's some mem slots stuff that bleeds into the address space, but other than that, KVM is quite oblivious, and MMU notifiers, I mean, but beyond that, KVM doesn't really talk address spaces today very much. And so the boundaries where you need the address space isolation are more once you get into the host and then you take an interrupt. That's not KVM at that point. That's core kernel code and you need some boundaries there. Yeah, the boundaries can be defined. I'm just wondering if this makes that potentially easier. I know there was a patch series for that like a year ago, I think, or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think it makes it meaningfully easier okay. because Getting, getting it to work in KVM is the easy part. Getting the rest of the kernel to be performant when you're switching between the address space you're using to trampoline into the guest and the address space you're using to service all the stuff in the host, those are the boundaries that are tricky and almost none of those are in KVM. Yeah, I have one question about these. I think one of the things I like to mention is like, if we have a multi-KVM kernel modules, it is easier to fix some non-trivial security uh, issues. Right? For example, something, you know, not necessarily all of the uh, uh, things that we can be live patched, uh, some of the functions uh, due to the limited size in the text, right? We have, uh, you know, with multi-KVM, I think this is much easier to do. You can modify basically arbitrary code and recompile. Uh, one thing I would like to raise is like, if you want to do this, is it really should be done in two phases? Well, one is like you have to separate the the common code, like access to those you know resources that is common to all of the KVM KOs as a step one, 
and then you know go to step two. I mean, the step one might be one you know stone to board, which allows the open up the uh, capability to, for other hypervisors to hook in. I mean, uh, as well. I think that goes back to Paula's question, though. Is there a use case for that that we'd be enabling from a within a series to enable something like this? Yeah, it would be two steps. You do all the prep work, and then you do some of the gory enabling in the back half of it. But in terms of accepting code upstream, unless there is an actual use case, if we did all of the isolation and collapsing of modules, we'd be doing a lot of churn, taking on a lot of complexity, and changing behaviors without any good reason. So I think from an upstream perspective, it kind of has to be all or nothing, except for maybe the isolation part that has value, in my opinion, irrespective of the multi-KVM stuff. That thing? Glad he doesn't have something to throw at us. <laughs> All right. So the next speaker couldn't be here. So uh, for those in the audience that don't know, we have a, a bi-weekly sort of uh, call of upstream KVM developers. So uh, he has to move his uh, discussion to that uh, occasion. But we have Alex and Ben and others that have provided a replacement. Uh, so if any of them want to come and explain, and they are experienced developers, so I'm sure that they will be able to do it without slides and without anything. 